welcome to Heritage. If I haven't met you yet, hi, I'm Kelsey. My husband is the worship pastor, the wonderful guy you just saw here on stage with us. I have two amazing kids who are around here somewhere. I'm not sure if they're up here right now. They're 14 and 12. And I also help to lead our women's ministry here. And I have the privilege of speaking to you on Mother's Day. I happen to be a chick like you, but more importantly, I am among you a journeyer on this journey with Jesus. And so I have some stuff I want to share with you this morning that we get to learn together more about the Lord's Word and just our relationships with Him and what life can truly be like. So I want to start by praying, settle my heart, settle your hearts as we lean in together. So Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Mother's Day that reminds us of true love. Thank you that you are the actual true love, the best love, the perfect love in our lives. And we just want to listen to you this morning. We want your help. I ask you, Lord, to fill my mouth with your words. You gave me my mouth. I believe you gave me these words. So, Holy Spirit, I pray for your anointing that would take them from words to transformation in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, when you were a kid, do you remember this little ditty? I've got the joy, 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 my heart. Where? Where? I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. Then it goes on to say, and I'm so happy, I'm so happy. I looked it up, and I even forgot the line that says, and if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on attack. I was like, whoa, vicious for a little kid, right? But the reality is we've got the joy, 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 joy down in our hearts. So guess what we get to talk about this morning? Joy. Joy. I get the privilege of talking to you about joy. I'm feeling it right now. Maybe you are, maybe you, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, but we're going to journey together to see what joy actually can look like in our lives. There are a lot of different things that can bring us joy. I have some options on the screen here. My family members, you know, different things bring us joy. The top left, that's my husband's joy. Fast, expensive cars from a distance, mind you, because we cannot afford these things. But they bring him joy. The upper right, our dog, Bailey, our daughter, our 14-year-old daughter, Bailey brings her so much joy. She loves animals, and maybe that's like you. The bottom left, if you've talked to Landon, our son, for five minutes, you know what his joy is. It's baseball. It's all he can talk about. And some of you out there might love sports just as much. It brings you a little bit of joy. The bottom right, it's just representing nature. And maybe if you're like me, you're feeling that. I love the beach. I love being outside. I love being with family. I love laughing with friends. All these things bring us so much joy. Or do they? Do they bring us joy? Or do they just make us happy? I knew when I was starting to write this message that we needed to start here, the difference between joy and happiness. Because if we don't tease out the difference between joy and happiness, we can actually miss the mark in our own lives. There are so many times throughout our days we're chasing this happiness, and I mean chasing it, because chasing happiness is actually kind of like a toddler that's running away from you, and you catch it, and then it runs away from you again. It's fleeting. It doesn't stay with us. Joy is actually something that's more lasting in our lives. So don't you think something more lasting is where we need to land our focus? On Compassion.com, they put it this way. The difference between joy and happiness is this. Joy is of the soul. Happiness is of the moment. Does that feel right? Joy is a practice, it's a behavior, it's deliberate and intentional, and we're going to be talking about that this morning. Happiness, it comes and it goes. Joy is an inner feeling. 
happiness is an outward expression. Does that feel right to you guys? You see that difference there? And it's so important for us to understand happiness is good, and it's fun, and it feels good. But if we chase happiness too much, we're going to find our lives actually feeling unfulfilled because joy is what's lasting. And the Bible says that to us over and over again. There's hardly any mention of happiness. There's mention of blessed, which kind of means happiness. But really where it lands in the Bible over and over, references over and over, is joy, 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 joy. And if the Bible tells us that's where our focus needs to be, guess what? That's where our focus needs to be. Joy has to be our target, not happiness. So if joy is our target... And if this reference that we've been landing on for the past several weeks, if you've been here in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, it tells us again, yep, joy is the thing. You don't see happiness in this list. The fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, then joy, peace, patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's a lot of fruit. The second one, though, is joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit in our lives, and it's our focal point for this morning. You know, the thing I love about this list, and this is what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. Last week was kindness and goodness that Pastor Justin talked about, and this week we focus on joy, but all of them are fruits of the Spirit. And these fruits, you know, the reason we're concentrating on them is because it's something that Jesus plants deep within us, but they can actually be really confusing and even frustrating because we don't necessarily know how to live them or embrace them in our lives. So we've been trying to travel that this last several weeks. Yeah, those fruits are there, but how do we make sure that we can live in a way that digs them up and that grows them and that makes our lives the best that they can be because we were made for more then we are actually often living. Do you agree with that? We're made for more than we are actually living, and we are made to live more joy than we are often currently living. So this morning, we do. We get to focus on the fruit of the joy, of the fruit of the Spirit called joy. And we're going to journey together to get more joy. Who wants more joy? Anybody? Yeah, me. You know, on a daily basis, it's like, where'd my joy go? So finding that joy again. So here's what we're going to do. Four things. We're going to recognize the joy that's in us. We're going to fight for joy. I love that one. We're going to land there for a little bit. We're going to grow more joy in us. And then we're going to be joy givers. We're going to give some joy away. So that's going to be our plan this morning. So first of all, recognizing the joy in us. You know, we talked about the difference between happiness and joy, so I want to go back there for a minute and remember what is this definition of joy so that we understand what it is that we have living inside of us. So joy is this. Joy is a feeling of great pleasure, but it's something we have to intentionally choose. It doesn't just find us. It brings us peace and a feeling of contentment no matter our circumstances. No matter our circumstances. That's what true joy is. Now, joy can look different, okay? And that's why it can be sometimes confusing. Joy can look like giddiness, like super excited about my birthday party coming up and being really giddy. Or it can be excited, cheering at a game and being joy-filled. Or it can be pleasantly surprised. And just a smile comes over your face. That can look like joy. Sometimes joy is as simple as sitting on the couch, being surrounded by your family, cuddled up in a cozy blanket, and just feeling contentment. That can look like joy. We have to understand the different looks of joy because sometimes if we don't know the spectrum of how joy can look, we actually think we don't have joy, and we do. There are so many ways that joy can look, and really good ways. But let's look at what the opposite of joy is, because we have to know that too. So if we know what joy is, what's the opposite? Well, let's see. There's the word sorrow, not joy. Heaviness, not joy. Numbness, 
not joy. So, like, what would you pick? Joy or sorrow? Sign me up for joy every day, all day. Numbness? No thanks. I want to have some emotions. Sign me up for joy all day, every day. But here's the thing. Although, yes, we have to intentionally to choose to live in joy, we don't have to choose to have it in us. <laughs> Guys, this is such good news for us this morning. And I was excited to remind us of this. Whenever you ask Jesus Christ into your heart, you automatically get the fruits of the Spirit. Automatically, they are planted inside of you. It's like this strawberry plant that I just bought yesterday. Please live. I'm not good with plants. So I'm planting this strawberry plant in this pot of soil. It's there. And my kids and I are going to try to take care of it. And it's there. It's in my pot. Do you see it? But it's up to me whether or not I see the fruit of that joy in my life. It's up to me to tend it so that it can actually grow into this. And, yes, they smell so good. Don't you want some? These strawberries, I have the strawberry joy plant already deep within me, but I may not be seeing the fruit yet. So we got to figure out, well, how do we get from it being planted in me, if I'm a Christian, to actually being a person who is giving the fruit of joy away day after day. And I want to recognize now that although we have it in us, there are many of us sitting here this morning who feel like it's been lost. Do you feel like your joy has been lost or buried? You knew that you had it before, but you can't feel it now? That's where we're starting. This is an important place to start. Because those words, the opposite of joy that we talked about, sorrow, numbness, heaviness, nestled right in the middle of those is this word depression. And it's a word that's thrown around a lot, but I think we don't exactly know what it means and we don't know what to do with it, nor do we know how to handle those who are going through it. So I want to read a stat to you. According to the recent Gallup poll, the percentage of U.S. adults who report having been diagnosed with depression at some point in their lifetime has reached 29%. That's over a quarter of our American people. And that's nearly 10 percentage points higher than in 2015. You guys, the rate of depression is on the rise unless we do something about it. Unless we do something about it. It's so common to feel that loss of joy and I understand because I have lived it. I have lived it. And it feels horrible. And you don't understand what's happening to you. It's a very hard reality. But I wanted to acknowledge that maybe you have lived it. Maybe you're currently living, living it. Or you might eventually live it at some point in your life. So as a community, I also want to look at you and say, if that is your current reality, that depression, that loss of joy, it's okay. It won't be there forever, and we're not going to consider it a weakness in you. No, no. Depression is not a weakness, and don't say that to someone else. And don't also tell them to just get over it and move on. No, no. Please, it's the last thing I needed to hear. It's the last thing that any of you need to hear. But there are, the reality is, there are things that try to steal our joy. And that's why we find ourselves with a loss of joy. Some of those things that I thought of that could steal our joy, traumatic circumstances, toxic thought patterns, others who have wronged us, Losing sight of our purpose or our identity, it's a real thing. Even our own bodies working against us. All of those things can make it feel like we have lost our joy, but, B-U-T, but, there's hope. Because there is a way to fight our way back to joy. It doesn't have to be your reality forever. There's a way to fight our way back to joy. And in fact, there's a lady who represents this, and she came to mind 
uh, pretty quickly as I was, ta- I was thinking through this fighting for joy. Her name's Candace Payne. And um, she released a video in 2016. You may or may not remember that name, um, but she released a video that got millions and millions of views. So I'm going to remind you who she is by showing you this short clip. Oh, my goodness. So that's Candace, or a.k.a. Chewbacca Mom. Remember that? Nodheads, yes? You remember that? 2016. I couldn't believe it was back in 2016. But this was just a mom who, you know, one day chose to go to Target and buy herself a little gift. And there's much more to that video. But she chose to buy herself a little gift, and then she wanted to make a video to share with some of her friends. Then she ended up having it on YouTube, and she went to bed that night with knowing that there were a lot of people looking at it, and her husband hadn't even chosen to look at it yet. She actually said that in a sermon I was listening to. And, and so she was like, oh, interesting. Like People are watching my video. I'm a little embarrassed. Maybe I want to take that video back. So then she went to bed that night. Then she woke up, you guys, with 24 million views. 24 million, and media outlets all over saying, we want an interview. You broke the viral records. With that, that ridiculous Chewbacca mask. But here's the thing. The reason people were attracted to it was because of her laugh, because of her joy, because it was contagious, because people don't, they want to feel things that they aren't currently feeling for themselves. That's Chewbacca mom. She brought us three minutes of joy back into our lives, and she broke records because of it. But here's what you have to know about Candace, because I actually read her book. This joy moment came from years of struggle. Depression, trauma, poverty, poor self-worth, and marital issues. She had to climb her way out of depression and fight her way back to joy, and her joy changed the world. Cool, right? Yeah. Her joy changed the world. And Candace fought her way back to joy, and so can we. So we're going to talk about four battle tactics to fight our way back to joy. You ready for these? If you're taking notes, here you go. First of all, cry out to God. Sounds simple, but we skip this step. (laughs) We just figure we're stuck. Cry out to God. You know, there's a writer in the Bible, David, who wrote a majority of the Psalms. And this was his battle tactic. Over and over again in the Psalms, he cried out to the Lord. In fact, in Psalm 4, it says, Answer me, God, when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. So he called and he called because David did not have an easy life. Some of it was because others were bad to him. Some of it was his own choices, but he had ups and downs. He was a shepherd to a king. He had sin. He had battles. He killed people. He was, people attempted to kill him. There, were, there was such a roller coaster in his life, and he knew who he had to cry out to when he was in that pit of despair and feeling rejected. And he found out in the end where his help come, came from. And that's what is represented in Psalm 121. He says, so beautiful, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help, our help, comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. My help comes from the Lord. We have to cry out to the Lord. We can't do it on our own. We can't fight our way back to joy on our own. We need to cry out to God. He's the only one who truly understands us. Let me say that again. God's the only one who truly understands you. Your ins and your outs, how you were made, your ups and your downs, he is the only one who will hear your tears over and over and not get tired of it. The only one. Trust me, I've been there crying 
over and over, having humans surround me, great humans, but they eventually get tired of it. God doesn't. So cry out to God. That is our first battle tactic. Number two, now even though those humans don't understand us all the time, it is so crucial to surround yourself with people who will jump into this journey of fighting back to joy with you. There's an author and a Christian speaker that I follow. Her name is Jenny Allen. She talks a lot about thoughts and emotions. And she actually said this quote recently, which was amazing. Our neural pathways, so that's things to our brain, that get broken in trauma actually get healed by being in your emotions with others, by being in your emotions with others. That doesn't mean you solve it and then you relate to others. Being in your emotions with others. So those neural pathways are healed through vulnerability. Choosing to reach out to other people and ask for help. Share where you're legitimately at at the time. It doesn't mean you have to spread your junk to everyone. No. (laughs) Don't tell everyone. When I was in my season of depression, I asked about five or six women. I told them exactly where I was at, and I said, help me. They would send me scripture. They would pray with me. They would send me encouragement, and they would tell me truth. The truth of how to get back to joy. Again, can I say it again? We can't fight our way back to joy or any of these fruits of the Spirit without the help of others. We can't do it on our own. The third battle tactic, refind your sense of purpose. Each and every one of us in this room has a unique sense of purpose, a reason to live our lives, a way to live our lives. And sometimes... We lose sight of it. And we do. When we do, it gets hard. But a lot of times if we lose that sense of purpose and we lose, start losing our joy, we start to retreat and isolate. And that is the opposite of what actually heals us. The thing that actually heals us is being in community and looking at what other people's needs are. Helping other people, finding ways to use our giftings that are within us, our unique personalities, reaching out to people, choosing to be around other people, asking the Lord again, what have you gifted for me me for? Remind me, please. Because when we self-isolate, when we aren't working, living in those giftings, when we self-focus, self-focus dries up the fruit of the Spirit. You can write that one down. Self-focus Any of these fruits of the Spirit, it'll dry it up. It'll be there, but it'll be dry. Speaking of being dry, you know what every plant needs is a little water, right, to grow? A little water. And we talked about the difference between joy and happiness, but I didn't by any means mean that we shouldn't have happiness in our lives. It just can't be our target, right? But you know the way that we can actually water our joy? is by intentionally reaching for happy moments in our life. Happy moments. There's a difference of chasing happiness and allowing happy moments to be part of what actually grows our joy and helps us to fight for it. You see, our brains, again, I think psychology is fascinating because of how God has made us, but our brains operate on things called neurochemicals. These neurochemicals are given to us to actually activate things in our minds that make us do certain actions, have certain thoughts, and have certain emotions. Well, guess what? We have a couple chemicals that are working with us toward joy. Dopamine and serotonin. Have you guys heard of those before? And there are ways that you can actually choose to have those neurochemicals activated in your life. You ready to hear these? Such simple, I mean, it's like simple, like, but mind-blowing brain-growing things that we can do. So here are your serotonin dopamine hits for this next week. And you can start your own list as well. These are just a few. Being in nature. Surprise, surprise. There's a reason we feel drawn outside. Movement and exercise. Yes, the health coach is going to tell you. Movement and exercise is vital for your dopamine and serotonin hits. Petting an animal. See, my, my daughter's not far off. Happiness. Petting Bailey, petting soft fur, there's something about it that activates those neurochemicals. Kissing a loved one. Men, when your wife wants a hug or a kiss, 
she's needing some dopamine or serotonin, just do it for her. You're helping her psychology, you know, happy wife, happy life, I mean, legit, okay? Even forcing yourself to smile. You know, we feel, we don't want to feel fake. We're, we're kind of a culture right now of authentic, right? I want to be authentic, and that's great, but sometimes you legitimately have to fake a smile. It does something to you, and it does something for others. Simple things, right? But now you can think of those simple things that you might do on a weekly basis, and I'm actually building my brain toward joy. I'm fighting my way back to joy by doing these things. And then maybe they'll grow and be more priority on your list of things to do. Just smiling. Just keep on smiling, just like Nemo. Keep on smiling. Keep on fighting. And again, I want to look you in the eyes this morning and say, if you are in this season where joy feels lost, number one, you're not alone. Number two, there's hope. Keep on fighting. You will find your joy again. You will find your joy again. But not all of us in this room are in this season where we, I don't feel like my joy is lost. I know it's there. But maybe I haven't thought about my joy recently. I haven't prioritized my joy. I haven't looked into intentionally growing my joy. So how do we do that? How do we grow our joy? Well, I'm glad you asked because I have some ways for you. Actually, I have one way for you. You know, as I was writing this, I started to write this list of things that have helped me in my life. And, and then I read the passage in Galatians again. And there's actually a simple action plan right before the fruits of the Spirit verse. So Galatians 5, if we go back there again, Galatians 5, I believe it starts in verse 16. It talks about our action plan for getting to, for growing more joy. It says, so I walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. But then it goes on to say in verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And then in verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Okay, so in those three verses alone, it's giving us our action plan. Walking with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit. Guess what all of those point to? A relationship. The only way to grow our fruits of the Spirit, to grow our joy, is to be in relationship. And I know you're in church, so you guessed it. Our relationship that needs to be grown the most is with God, but here's why. Just like me planting this strawberry plant, I know when I planted it. I know how deep I'm planting it in. I'm knowing how much I already watered it. We have to be in relationship with the one who made the seeds, tends the seeds, and grows the seeds. That's the only way that this joy can be grown in our life. And as much as I wanted to give you a step-by-step -step way to grow this relationship, you know, every relationship looks different. So you growing closer to God, I'm not going to tell you how to do that. But I'll give you two tips, two things that are consistent for all of us in growing any relationship. You have to know the person better, and you have to talk to them more. And guess what? We have two ways of doing that in Christian life that are pretty basic and pretty easy. Knowing someone more. It's called the Bible. The more we read the Bible, the more we know God. And actually, here's an analogy for you. So once or twice a year, I will ask my wonderful husband, Joel, you know, I would love to get a card that just says in it what you think about me, what you love about me, what's good about me, because on a daily basis, sometimes I lose sight of how you feel about me. So he'll give me a card, and you know what I do that with that? I'll put it in my nightstand and... I'll, I'll get it out. Maybe if we've had an argument, be like, okay, that is what he believes about me. So that card is always there as a love letter reminding me what he truly believes about me and who I truly am. Guess what's a love letter to us? 
the Bible. You know, we, we see this as an overwhelming book of just pages and pages of God's commands for our life. No, that's not what the Bible is. The Bible is a love letter to us, God telling us who he knows us to be and who he is. Why wouldn't we want to read it? It helps us get to know him. Helps us get to know how much he loves us. So this is your starting point for building a new relationship or a renewed relationship with God. The other thing you have to do in any relationship is talk more. Sorry, men. The talking. It's part of a relationship, right? And God wants us to talk to him. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says pray continually. Two words, but feel heavy. They feel like heavy words. Pray continually. What do you mean? I have a job. Does that mean I have to be on my knees with my hands extended, repenting and and crying out to God? No, that's not what pray continually means. Yes, there will be moments of that kind of prayer in your life where it's an intense and heavy and very, like, time, time intense, you know, an hour or whatever. But normally, pray continually means have a running text conversation with God. Be in touch with him. Have a conversation as you're out walking. Say a thank you. Say a please. Say a, hey, I didn't know that about you. You made that beauty over there. Hey, I didn't know this about me. I need your help here. It's all about this running dialogue. It doesn't have to be something that's overwhelming. And as much as like with a friend that you have a running text thread with, it builds your relationship with them. It's simple, right? But it builds our relationship with God who gives us joy because that's the only way that our joy can grow. Good news, bad news? I think it's good news for us. It's the only way that our joy can grow. In order to grow your joy, bottom line, you have to know the one who gives you, plants the joy in you. So we've recognized what joy is, we've um, talked about maybe needing to fight for joy, which sometimes we don't think about. We've learned a little bit about, okay, so growing joy means a relationship, but is that it? So I'm growing this plant, this nice strawberry plant, and I'm just going to get to eat it myself and just enjoy it, and it looks really pretty in my house, and I get good fruit that I can put on in my smoothies, but that's not actually what growing these fruits of the Spirit is about. And to find out what it's about, again, going back to our Galatians 5 passage, again, this context was like, the Lord's so good the way he authors things because he doesn't just give us one random verse. He gives us an actual action plan all around a verse that tells us about these fruits of the Spirit. So in Galatians 5, it actually starts that passage where embedded is our verse. It says, That the greatest thing, the biggest commandment in our lives is to love one another. To humbly treat each other. To not devour each other. It actually says that. Do not devour each other. But to love one another. And then, guess what it talks about? Things that pull us from loving one another. And then the fruits that help us to love one another. So this joy... This fruit that's being grown in us, it's not actually about us. Now, it can make our lives a lot happier, feel more fulfilled, can feel lighter, can feel more content. So that's great. God loves that for us because, man, he gives us good gifts. (laughs) I mean, he plants such beautiful things in our lives, and joy is one of those. But ultimately... We get joy so we can share joy. Like, I can just taste this on my own and, oh, yummy. But that won't actually fulfill what this passage is talking about. This fruit that we're growing in our lives is meant to be given away to others. We're supposed to be joy givers. Joy givers. I'm sure someone can come to mind of who's a joy giver in your life. There are a couple of things that I think we need to concentrate on. If I'm going to be a joy giver, how do I do that? Two simple things. Like the Chewbacca mom, what'd she do? She shared her life with the world. 
She changed an atmosphere by laughing. Changed an atmosphere. We can be atmosphere changers. How do you do that? You smile like we already talked about. You allow yourself to laugh. Have you thought about that before? Sometimes our laughter like gets stuck here. And we know people are like, I think they think this is funny, but I would never know it because it's not coming out of them. Like, allow yourself to laugh. It's a good thing. My husband sometimes shushes me in the movie theater. He's like, shh, that's a lot of laughing. <laughs> but I love to laugh, and I have, like, a broad sense of humor. I, don't, I think it comes from my mom. You could hear her laugh, like, forever away away. It's like Dawn Anderson. The beauty of her laughter just <laughs> spreads through a building and changes an atmosphere. So laughing more. Seeing more, the worship this morning, did it lighten your heart? Probably. (laughs) Singing more actually helps us to be an atmosphere changer, a joy giver, and maybe a little dancing here and there. Dance it up in the grocery store. My kids are really embarrassed right now that I'm even starting to move my hips. They're like, Mama, stop doing that. But you know what? We can change atmospheres by our bodies, our smiles, our voices, our laughs. Don't we want to be atmosphere shifters? Do we want to walk into a room and somebody feel more like despondent and sad after we leave? Or do we want them to feel like, wow, they've really lifted my spirits up. I feel encouraged. I feel better because they're around. I want to be the last one. But I know there are certain days that I have not had that effect on an atmosphere. So we have to be aware of it. Also, The other way we can give joy to others, we can find out what brings them happiness and do it for them. We we have to know each other well. Like, notice what brings happiness to other people. Some of you might have read the Five Love Languages book. Well, you know, it's significant for a reason because the things that we can do to bring others happiness is give compliments, you know, a little, hey, you're looking good today, or hey, that was a really good thing you did, blah, blah, blah. You can do a service act for someone. You can help them. Some people helped Terry Meyer with her fence yesterday. Service acts bring joy to other people. Give a meaningful gift. Maybe it's jewelry. Maybe it's flowers. Maybe it's a piece of chocolate. Who knows? But you can do something so simple, but because they feel known, they feel like you're changing their joy. You can also spend time with someone. Quality time. It's a thing. It's an important thing. Those are ways that we can notice who people are, notice what makes them happy, and start to water their joy plants as well. We can water other people's joy plants and help them to grow. But I want to pause here and recognize this. Right now, out among you, we have a lot of joy givers. I know because they're moms. Can, if you're a mom, raise your hand, please. If you're a mom... Okay, look around at these moms. Look around at these moms. Joy givers, you guys. Thank you. Can can we applaud the moms? Come on. I mean, here's the thing about being a mom. It is not easy to be a joy giver. Because you are not only having to grow your own joy, you're having to grow enough of it to give it away. And being a mom is exhausting. And sometimes we carry a lot of loads for a lot of people. And I don't mean laundry loads, which is that. But we're carrying a lot of emotional stuff for other people as well. And so these women are strong who are among us. They have chosen to be in those hard moments and yet give to other people. They have chosen to give you joy day after day, year after year, helping to build your life so that it can be joy-filled. It can be joy-filled. But men and kids here, please help us. We have to help each other be full of joy and be joy givers. When our loads get too heavy, it's like trudging through sand to be the only carrier of joy in our home. So lighten their load. Do some chores. Give a compliment. Give a hug. Some of the things we talked about, right? Like water their joy plants too. Don't just expect them to be the joyful being in your home. It's a give and take, this joy thing. We can grow it in our own lives, but it's about helping each other grow it too. 
in our homes, in our church family, in our communities. Joy's worth it, but it's a team, it's a team effort. So here's where I want us to land today. Fruit of the Spirit, amazing things. Some plants, I'll let you know how my strawberry plant's doing in a couple weeks, who knows. Things that are planted in us, sometimes we don't know that it's there. But the good news is this, if you have Jesus Christ living in you, you have joy in you. Joy is already in us, whether you feel it or not. Joy is in us. That's good news. It's there for us. I love it. But we do have to tend it. We have to choose to recognize it, to fight for it, to grow it. So this is the question I want to leave us with this morning. What stage of fruit development are you in? We know joy's in us. But legitimately, are you having a hard time fighting for it right now? Or do you know it's there, but you're like, I wish I felt it more often. I wish it was more consistent in my life. You know that you need to grow it more. Or do you have a lot of joy, but it's trapped in your 1,200 square foot home, and you need to be giving it away to some other people more? So where are you at legitimately? Legitimately. And I want to I pray over our moms, our joy givers here for a minute. But also, we're going to have prayer partners down here because, again, did you hear me say you can't do it alone? Any of these fruits of the Spirit, you can't do it alone. And that's why we have prayer partners. Someone can, who can help you ask, seek the Lord and fight for that joy and grow the joy in your life. So they will be up here. And whatever season you're in, find us. I'll be up here. Find us. We will pray with you as the worship team leads a song. But I want to pray over all of our moms. If you're near a mom, will you put your hand on them right now, please? Touches are good things. We're so thankful for you, moms. Jesus, thank you for creating the privilege of motherhood. There are some of us who actually had to fight to be moms. Some of us who might still be in that fight. Some of us who might be in the fight to reclaim a relationship with our kids. But Jesus, thank you for the privilege of being mothers. But it's not always easy. So as moms, we ask, Lord, tap us, nudge us back to seeking you about how to do this momming well. You know our hearts cries to want to parent well with wisdom, with patience, with goodness, with giving good gifts to our kids, to our husbands. And you know we want to do it with more joy, but it's hard. So please help us. And Jesus, I pray today that those around the moms would think of very special ways to help grow the joy of our moms, to carry a bit of the load. Thank you, Jesus. You know, my heart is the most important thing I wanted out of our time this morning was to know that you are a good God. You give us so many good things and a lot of times we don't recognize it, so we apologize. But thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for being the joy giver. Thank you for loving to hear our laughs, to see our smiles, to talk with us, for us to know how much you love us by reading your word. Jesus, we want to know you more. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.